speaker is Mia Yesh uh, from Permitter Institute and the University of Waterloo. Uh, Mia Yesh. Hello. Let me see. Hello. I cannot turn on my uh, camera. Uh, it's because it's locked. So I guess someone needs to unlock it. Yes, please. Uh, Priya, can you please unlock uh, Nia Yesh's camera? Okay, I think I Is can do that now. Uh, okay, it's happening. Uh, okay, quality. Do you want medium quality, high quality, low quality? <laughs> Let's start with medium quality. So. Okay, medium quality. We go medium quality. Thank you. Um, and it says it gives me an option of sharing the screen, but I'm not sharing my screen, right? I just. Uh, no, I, yes, I guess you're. The slides are here, so you can. So okay, I can just move forward and backward here, I guess. Um, hmm. okay, so okay. Uh, and okay, good. So uh, should I get a start? Should I start? Please, please, Nish, yes. Okay, good. Um, let me see whether I can make this a bit bigger. It looks a bit small, but I guess it's because of you guys are seeing me. Um, Make presentation for screen. Okay, good. Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm sorry I cannot see you, or I can, I'm sorry I cannot uh, be there in person. But I guess everybody is remote. So, uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's pandemic. If if it had some one benefit is made everything more democratic, so nobody can uh, well travel anywhere. So everybody is equal to every, any, anybody else, no matter where they are, as long as they have an internet connection, which of course could be a problem. Uh, well, uh, thank you for uh, thank you, Nima, and, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, very interesting conference. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be for earlier talks because it was too a bit too early uh, here in uh, the North American time. Uh, although I did hear the the, the last uh, I think two or three talks. And okay, so t this is a slightly different theme. Uh, it's uh, it's about black holes rather than cosmology. I guess the connection is that I am a cosmologist by training, and uh, so I just uh, drifted into uh, drifted into uh, doing black holes uh, for reasons that may become clear uh, during this talk. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a slightly different flavor. It is exotic. Uh, uh, I can't quite decide whether the black, uh, quantum black holes are more exotic than extraterrestrial life or not, but it is, uh, I guess it is, they're both kind of exotic. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get us started. And you, you can see my, uh, my point as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, motivations for quantum black holes, uh, uh, about what pandemics can tell us about quantum black holes, which is, I, I guess, maybe you find it in interesting. Uh, about quantum black holes in the sky and quantum black hole seismology. So, uh, and you're going to give me a, a five minute warning, Nima? Yes, sure. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope I, I can stick to my time. Okay, so five minute warning system. Okay. Uh, Good, good. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's get into it. And uh, I guess we can. If you type questions in the chat, I'll try to look at them as I'm as I'm talking or at the end of the talk, as 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 you please. So uh, so let's talk about why we care about quantum black holes. And it's... yeah, so this is this is the golden age for black hole ast black hole astrophysics. Of course, you have seen. The now famous picture uh, of the black hole at the center of M87 galaxy that was taken about a year ago, and the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, uh, more than just just about more than two years ago was awarded to the LIGO collaboration, uh, who uh, discovered the first evidence from gravitational waves uh, you, uh, using gravitational waves from mergers of two stellar mass black holes. So we 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 making very rapid progress in understanding, at least in observing black holes. 
Uh, and what makes black holes so special is the fact that they have event horizons. Uh, so that those are these uh, places in a space time that separate regions of a space time that are doomed to fall into a singularity or be crushed by a singularity. Uh, and regions that uh, are not uh, necessarily doomed. And uh, so people in outside the horizons can escape to infinity uh, if they have powerful enough rockets. People who are inside the horizon, according to the laws of relativity, have no chance. And this is what makes black holes special. And this is what, uh, uh, what we are now starting to explore because uh, we cannot, uh, of course, light cannot escape from the horizon of the black hole, but it can get out from outside of it. And that's what we are, we are now seeing with uh, either gravitational wave observations or uh, from electromagnetic observations. Uh, another surprising feature of the black holes, which is now around 40 years old, is, uh, is black hole thermodynamics, that there are the same laws of thermodynamics that we, we study uh, as uh, undergraduates applies to black holes. If you make some identifications, you define a temperature based on the surface gravity of the black holes and you define the entropy proportional to the horizon area. Then uh, you have all the same laws of thermodynamics uh, with these definitions for black holes. Uh, the, the, so that was a big revelation due to Hawking and collaborators, um, Beckenstein, Hawking, uh, Pardin and Carter, and many others, also including Bill Ondru, who uh, kind of uh, identified the meaning of this temperature. Um, but the, uh, okay, so what is happening? But the real uh, puzzle with, uh, with these laws is that uh, what does this entropy correspond to uh, in every other thermodynamic system? Uh, okay, so t I should turn off my webcam. Let me see. Okay, uh, I don't know in terms of, is that better? Maybe I can, but I mean, I got, I, uh, okay. So, does that solve the problem? No, it, it's fine now. Okay, okay, then. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, so the next question, so the question that the real puzzle in terms of black hole physics, at least theoretically, is that what does this uh, entropy correspond to? What does it mean? Because in other thermodynamic systems, entropy counts the number of degrees of freedom, log of the number of states uh, is, uh, uh, log of the number of states is given by, um, um, uh, it gives, gives basically the entropy, but however, in this case, we don't really know what are the states of the black hole because we don't really have a quantum theory of gravity. Okay. So, sorry about this. I think I need to turn this off. Okay, good. Um, now, so the problem with the horizons is, uh, I mean, and this whole involves something that has to do with quantum mechanics. Uh, the most famous one is the information paradox. Uh, so Hawking basically showed that in addition to this black hole thermodynamics, in fact, black holes do evaporate. So that temperature uh, does correspond to some black body radiation or, or gray body radiation, I should say. Uh, but then what happens to the information in the black hole that goes into the black hole? Uh, and the answer is not uh, exactly clear yet. Um, so there are various variants of this information paradox. There is a question of quantum tunneling. So there are arguments uh, originally due to Samir Mathur that shows that uh, even though classically you would think black holes are big, quantum effects shouldn't be important because they have a huge entropy. Then uh, even though probability of quantum tunneling is exponentially small, the number of states you could tunnel to is exponentially big. And this product is approximately a word of one. So, um, so quantum tunneling, which basically is an, another name for non-perturbative non effects, could become important for black holes. Um, and another connection is one that we kind of brought, brought me into this game, was the connection to dark energy that potentially could uh, explain the scale of dark energy, but at, at the expense of getting rid of the horizon of the black hole, replacing it by uh, some sort of a quantum structure. Okay, so... Let's see, actually, it does work actually, good. Um, so, uh, 
let's see. So uh, let me um, explain. So a, a little bit about the firewall paradox, which is one of the, mo the, the most recent refinement of the uh, black hole information paradox. So the idea is that the, these four principles that are usually thought, or four postulates that are usually thought to be uh, um, to be correct in the evolution of black holes or big black holes at least, uh, they're not cannot be consistent. First is the unitarity of quantum mechanics. Second is equivalence principle or no drama at the horizon, and the third is the quantum field theory outside the black hole. Um, at least the local quantum field theory. And the fourth is that the area of the black hole is essentially the entropy. That means the dimension of the Hilbert space is uh, exponential of area divided by 4G. So these four are not consistent with each other. And, uh, um, okay, did I go too far? Let's see. Let me see, I think. Yeah, okay, so, so and, and the firewall proposal is that in fact the horizon is replaced by something more exotic. So that's, uh, that's what firewall often refers to, uh, although you cannot actually prove that that's based on this, uh, based on this theorem, uh, but the argument, which is not a mathematical argument, is just a heuristic one, that the most conservative solution is to relax the second assumption, which is the uh, regularity or no drama at the horizon. So what happens if you have no drama at the horizon? And, okay, so what you can get is, uh, and this is where kind of, uh, I got into the game uh, of gravitational waves, uh, or, uh, our group did, was shortly after gravitational waves was discovered by the Liger collaboration, we realized that, um, uh, we realized that one possibility, uh, and in fact it was pointed out by Cardoso and collaborators, uh, basically within, within a month of when the discovery was announced, that if you have something near the horizon, it could reflect gravitational waves, so some sort of quantum structure or firewall, and you don't ex just see gravitational waves from merger of two objects, you may see these echoes uh, that come from the gravitational waves that are uh, stuck between um, between this firewall and the angular momentum barrier, which is, so this part is just from a standard general relativity, but then this part is the one that would be more exotic physics, and echoes are stuff that are stuck in between. Um, so this is basically the same way that if you go into a mountain and then shout, you're gonna hear your own echoes because your voice is gonna be reflected uh, from, the, from the mountains. Now here, we, instead of voice, we have gravitational waves, and instead of mountains, we have this firewall. And then you could hear multiple echoes if these firewalls are there. If you don't have a firewall, so you don't see it, hear any echo because everything just goes through and falls into the horizon. Now the interesting thing is that the time scale for this process is, uh, is not a very long time scale. Uh, uh, can, can you see the slide? It seems that, uh, that people cannot see the slide. Um, actually, I can see, but... Sometimes because the network is poor, then you should wait a little bit. Uh, I think maybe there might be a delay. For yes, some I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please go ahead. It okay. seems, uh, Muhammad is, okay. Okay, so it, it looks like everybody is okay. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. So it might have been like an isolated problem, which hopefully is resolved. Uh, okay, so, so for example, for the first event that LIGO detected, this, this GW150914, this time scale for echoes, if you have quantum structure on the Planck scale, is around 0.3 seconds, which is a very detectable time scale. Okay, so moving on. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, what happens at the horizon or uh, is uh, how much reflectivity you expect is something that we worked on recently. Uh, and um, it, it is not a clear a priori how much reflectivity you expect from firewalls, but we put to, uh, forward uh, with, uh, with my uh, student, uh, Ching Wen Wang and uh, a postdoc, Naritaka Oshita, uh, we, uh, we actually put forward three different arguments that all suggest that a quantum firewall or a quantum horizon should have a reflectivity that's uh, given by a Boltzmann factor. 
So uh, for large frequencies, uh, you expect no reflectivity, so black holes are indeed black. But if the frequencies become comparable to the Hawking temperature, then you expect our uh, appreciable, free, uh, appreciable reflectivity. And this is why gravitational waves are the way to see this, like why, in, for example, even horizon telescope wouldn't be able to see this, because you, they look at much higher frequencies. Uh, so in fact, uh, we, we, we came, with, came up with this neat explanation for what echoes could be. Um, let's see whether I can move forward, yes. So basically the idea is that echoes are just a stimulated Hawking radiation. So if you have an isolated black hole in vacuum, uh, Hawking told us that it radiates, uh, and you could think about this radiation. Uh, if you think about black hole as some huge atom, uh, this radiation is just a spontaneous emission of some excited state. So just black hole goes from one excited state to the next, to the next, to the next, and emits light or, uh, or gravitational waves. Uh, how well you could be, for atoms, you know, you could have a stimulated emission as well. So if you uh, immerse an atom in a, in, a, in a bath of photons, it could actually uh, stimulate transition from excited state to a less excited state. Uh, if you have photons of the right frequency. And uh, basically what, what we show is that that reflectivity corresponds to uh, a stimulating uh, Hawking radiation by, uh, uh, by the incoming gravitational waves. So, that's, uh, so that basically that would be the physical mechanism of making echoes is basically via a stimulating Hawking radiation. Uh, so there has been more work on, uh, on this in, in, from a very surprising direction. So 10 years before all of this, uh, uh, there was a suggestion by Lena, uh, Lenny Soskin and uh, uh, Yasuhiro Sakino that black holes are fastest scramblers. So they're the fastest way of basically uh, uh, scrambling information across an object. Uh, and the time scale for this, if you look through this paper, it goes as some constant times log of the uh, number of degrees of freedom or log, log of the qubits. And for a black hole, this is exactly the same as the echo time uh, where the C is um, a number to be specified, basically, a number of order one. So this, is, this was kind of surprising, but then we looked at it uh, more and... Um, it's coming. So in my PhD student, Christian Saraswat, uh, we showed actually, in fact, in all various types of observations or types of black holes, the predicted echo time and the scrambling time for quantum information, they happen to be equal to each other. Uh, if, if they're defined properly, and of course, uh, there is some choice of definition of how exactly you define echoes and how exactly you define a scrambling, but if you define them uh, the way that basically uh, with, with, with some choices, uh, most of the time at least, uh, when there is no ambiguity, then these two times are actually the same. So that was kind of surprising. Uh, and that gives us some hope to get some... Um, uh, uh, so yeah, so we showed that these two are the same, and uh, these two time scale. I guess it's taking a while to go through this. And... Um, and that gives us some hope that maybe we could understand these echoes from some holographic uh, picture. Uh, and so we have some, some work ongoing. So there's one paper that we already have uh, published and another with Ramit Day that uh, may, uh, may shed some light on a holographic understanding of echoes. Okay, so that was a kind of longish introduction. So how much, uh, how much time do I have, uh, uh, Nima? Is, uh on maybe less than 10 minutes. Less than 10 minutes, okay, so let's see. So I have one slide that uh, I, I guess a couple of us I was kind of curious that I'm kind of, uh, com uh, comparing pandemics and echoes, and I don't know what to make of it, but I was, I've been thinking in the past couple of months a lot, a lot about COVID-19 since it's affecting everybody's life. You all have seen this. Um, and uh, I got kind of curious, uh, and I actually made this plot a couple of weeks ago. So this is the daily growth rate of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, or relative growth rate, I should say. So basically, uh, the, number of, uh, the number of people who die one day 
divided by the number of people who died the day before, and it has actually two peaks. Uh, and the, the, uh, one is basically, this is for North America and Europe, and this is for China, and then the separation is the log of the number of humans on Earth divided by this maximum, which happens to be exactly the time I scale for the echoes. This is for 15 or 9, 14. So uh, it sounds kind of mysterious, but I feel, I, I mean, this, I have a way of understanding is heuristically, which has to do with understanding exponentials. So this is a time scale that basically your exponentials can become very big or very small. And uh, for echoes, basically, this is a time scale where you have order one uh, size of the horizon perturbations that could decay to Planck size perturbations. And that's the time scale for the echoes. And this is the time scale, basically, where you have a pandemic that's going exponentially, uh, could have spread from one person to the entire population of the world. So it's, it's kind of intriguing, but the uh, question is then, what else, what else does this imply? Is it just a simple uh, coincidence, or there is more to learn from this? Of course, I'm not going to talk about that, but I was, I, I was a curious observation. OK, so let me show you what we have. Uh, uh, so I guess in the remaining less than 10 minutes, I just want to give you, tell you briefly about the status of echoes. So I'm going to talk about the observational status and then theoretical status. So uh, I'm going to go through these quickly. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, skip the slides. Uh, yeah, because this is going. So, so basically, the, the idea is that echoes uh, to LIGO-Virgo uh, collaboration or the gravitational waves are similar to the Higgs to, uh, to, for Large Hadron Collider. They're both kind of pre predictions of a theory if you require consistency of principles basic unitarity, effective field theory, uh, and the last principle is the symmetry of the theory. So holographic uh, entropy or diffeomorphism symmetry tells you about the firewall paradox that, that leads to echoes. And then gate symmetries of a standard model leads to the prediction of Higgs. And there might be, well, certainly there is now evidence, uh, significant evidence for the presence of Higgs. For echoes, things are a bit more con controversial, but the theoretical underpinning of the two, two concepts are very similar. And uh, a few years ago, we had, uh, we had some uh, possible uh, evidence for it in LIGO data in the first three events. Now, I, I, I think I, uh, I should apologize because I, uh, I have every build as a single slide and it gives you a delay. So this was the Jahid Abedi who, is, uh, who, who was uh, at Sharif University when uh, he did this, and Hannah Dakar who was a... Uh, uh, was an undergraduate student who was visiting me. And incident, you may not know Hannah, she's a graduate student, but in fact, her mother won the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years afterwards. So her mother is, in, in fact, very, very famous. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so here is just a brief summary of um, uh, basically where, where, where the status is. So basically, this, is, this plot is from dark energy, but basically the idea of what I was going to say is that you start believing the echoes when you see a lot of evidence for it. And here I've compiled various works. Uh, so the p-value is the probability of basically things being consistent with noise. Uh, and um, so these are basically all the kind of what I call positive evidence with p-value of less than 5%. And there are basically nine different analyses. They're not all completely independent, but, uh, but uh, they are from different groups, and there are different analyses. And they find a range of p-values between like something very small. Uh, now this group claims 10 to the minus 10 for the p-values. But, but the last published one is 10 to the minus 5, up to around 5.5%. So these are basically six, nine different analyses that find evidence are directly or indirectly for echoes. And, um, and I'm not going to have time to go through these details, but it turns out there are also other groups who look for it and don't find it, and I think there could be possible reasons for it. Uh, but yeah, so, so the status is still uncertain, but it seems that there are, there are at least a, a lot of groups that find something in the data that's curious. Uh, thanks, Nima, I still have five minutes left. So if you want to see more about what's going on and kind of our detailed analysis of this, um, oh, actually, so this is an example of this uh, independent confirmation. Um, so this is a paper 
which is coming. Uh, so this is the time scale uh, that this group saw. Let me tell last year find for, found for echoes from these two, uh, from, uh, from the two events, second and third gravitational wave events. And uh, if you look, this is our paper from uh, basically four years ago now, and uh, from with Jaha Dabri and Hannah that they mentioned. And this is our prediction from Planck scale for Planck scale echoes. So these two time scale happen to coincide exactly with these two time scale. Uh, uh, so that's kind of uh, surprising that these things match with each other. Uh, and if you want to read more about this, um, I suggest that you uh, look at our review paper, which we look at various theoretical and observational aspects of echoes. And there are also two conferences that you could, uh, you could watch all the talks online. Uh, so more, one was from a few months ago and the other one from a few years ago. Uh, and uh, various discussions and uh, various points of view on this. So I guess I don't really have too much time about to talk about the title of the talk, which is quantum black hole seismology. So I'm just gonna to kind of say a few words. And unfortunately, I don't have a very good way of advancing through the slides. Uh, I have to go through. Um, maybe I can find actually a way to um, uh, decide which slide to go to. Okay, so this was the work that we've done with Naritako Shita, who was a postdoc at Perimeter, and uh, Daichi, Sun, Daichi Suna, who is a PhD student and part of LIGO collaboration at, um, at, uh, at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and basically here we're just kind of doing, the, uh, saying in these two papers that if you apply the same principles that people who do astro seismology, if you apply that to um, quantum black holes, then you could basically probe the inner structure of quantum black holes uh, and various uh, properties of these exotic objects. So let me now uh, see whether, I mean, in the interest of time, let me see, I'm just going to try to skip this through the slides, see how well that goes. So this is an example of the kind of thing you could do, um, uh, which is, uh, this is kind of the spectrum of the black hole as a function of frequency. And, uh, um, and you see that for, if you ch change the properties, for example, the reflectivity from Boltzmann to constant reflectivity, you see these various peak structures that, you, uh, that appear. And here the, the different colors are different spins of the black hole. And you see that if you have basically no reflectivity, you don't see anything special. But if you add reflectivity, uh, then you see this peak structure, which has to do with this uh, echo chamber. Uh, or the, the, the resonance of the natural frequencies of the modes that are stuck between the firewall and, um, and, uh, and the angular momentum barrier. So you could actually probe all of these. You could probe the temperature uh, uh, of the black hole. You could probe the, the harmonic structure. You could probe the, the law of reflectivity and, and, and various other features. So let me see whether I can jump to the conclusions now. Um, Okay, so this is uh, this is has to do with the law of reflection. So I'm just going to try. So just give me a second because uh, I'm out of time. So I'm just going to try to find my conclusion slide without walking you through all the other slides. Okay, so uh, so this is a slide number fifty-one. Fifty-one. Okay, so. So again, thanks for bearing with me through this. Uh, sorry, I think I, was, uh, I had a little bit more slides than I expected. So, so the conclusion is that quantum black holes may uh, be much more interesting than their classical counterparts and in very testable ways. And the status of tests are still controversial. Um, so logarithmically delayed echoes appear in diverse contexts from quantum black holes to quantum information and to pandemics. So it's kind of fascinating that we kind of, when I've been working on this topic, I've been reading a lot of uh, uh, literature on gravitational wave uh, astrophysics and detectors, but also on quantum information and uh, scrambling, which is quantum computing is a hot topic now. And also on pandemics, which is a weird, weird kind of in, uh, intersection of topics. But what they, all they have in common are kind of exponentials that get very, very large. And those exponentials, uh, they all lead to pro something like an echo time in them. 
Uh, so there's tantalizing, though controversial hints for echoes in LIGO data. Uh, so black hole seismology is a system, which this is a program that Narutaka Ashita, Daichi Suna, and I introduced, and it's a systematic way to probe quantum structure of the black holes. And basically the way we do it is that the same way that people in solar seismology or astro seismology or even seismology of Earth, they do it. And that's by uh, looking at the structure of uh, natural frequencies of excitations uh, that exist. And uh, let me see. So, and I guess this is my, my, my final line. Don't ask what echoes can do for you. Ask what you can do for echoes. So this is my invitation to start working on this and I start looking for echoes because um, I think the more people look at it, the clearer the picture hopefully gets. But maybe I should be careful about what I'm looking about what I'm wishing for. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Niyash. It was very interesting. Uh, we have time for a question. Okay, maybe just one question. You can read some of them, Niyash. Yeah. So. Um, so there is one question by Mohammad uh, Talazadeh who says, uh, I'm wondering to know whether there is any relation between echoes and super radiance. So that's an excellent question. So super radiance um, is uh, this phenomenon that if you have a spinning black hole, then an incoming uh, gravitational wave or like a magnetic wave or any other wave, in fact, can be, uh, can be enhanced, uh, even though black holes are supposed to absorb things. Uh, and this enhancement is because basically the energy, uh, because of the ergo regions near the black hole horizons, which uh, could basically convert uh, a spin energy of the black hole into, uh, into the outgoing energy of the radiation. So, so uh, that, that's of course completely in classical general relativity, but it, it, it does play an interesting I interface uh, with echoes because if you have perfect reflectivity, for these firewalls, then uh, this super radiance leads to a super radiance instability uh, uh, or ergo region instability. Uh, so people have used this to put, put constraints on these echoes. Uh, but it turns out if you have a little bit of absorption, like in Boltzmann uh, scenario, then um, then that instability is suppressed. So there's no instability. But it's interesting that this uh, this inter inter basic interface between super radiance and uh, and echoes could lead to interesting constraints, and we have explored that in our paper uh, with with Narutaka and with, with Cheng. So that's the, indeed there is. I think there's an interesting uh, interplay between the two. They're not the same things. Uh, I mean, super radiance is classical, echoes are quantum, but but nevertheless, there is a, there's they they work together in interesting ways. So mm. there is another mm. question. Oh, sorry. Yes. yes, yes, please. There is uh, the question by Hossein, which is echoing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So do you presume a specific boundary condition to solve your equations? If so, how, how would the results change with, uh, with changing boundary? That, that, that's an excellent question. So this is one of the things actually I was, uh, uh, I was talking about. If I, if I know which slide I should jump to, actually, let me. Let me actually find a slide that uh, has this and right. Okay, so this is 45. Let me go to slide 45. Um, so, so indeed, this is one of the things that we could probe with uh, black hole seismology is the boundary con condition. So here is uh, what the phase of the reflection. So I mean, if you have a reflecting surface, uh, upon reflection, your wave could change its phase. And uh, so you could have a Drishle or Neumann boundary condition. These are kind of red versus blue. Uh, so you ignore this. Uh, let's say we want to set M equal to zero, just for simplicity. Uh, but uh, so you have, like, you have Drishle versus Neumann boundary condition. That actually shifts the position of your peaks because your resonances, uh, resonance frequencies do depend on this. And indeed, that's something that we can probe. Um, we think, at least based on some observations, that this is consistent with, uh, with Drishle boundary conditions. But that's, uh, that's indeed one of the things that we can probe through this seismology program. Another thing is basically the amplitude of reflection, which is what I, was, what I call reflectivity. And that also can be probed. And uh, I don't think it's quite clear which, which law of reflectivity works well. So we have a table 
that says that basically, depending on some assumptions, some laws of reflexivity work better than others in fitting the data. But those are all uh, uncertainties in, in modeling. Okay, thank you very much, Nish. Uh, so uh, we thank you. <laughs> and uh, okay. let's stop here. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I guess, I guess then I can just uh, stop. Uh, yeah, stop sh my microphone then. Okay, thanks. Okay.